Hello and welcome to Madness of Two, a podcast where good or bad, positive or negative, we talk about what makes you mad and also provide a safe space to talk about mental health issues, personal and those, uh, you know, in the larger world as well. I'm Joe Medforth and it is my sincere pleasure to welcome, I think, a podcast first... We've been on a podcast before? Yeah, man. Ah, fantastic. Luke Ridge, manager of Chaos City Comics, the best comic book shop in the world, and illustrator extraordinaire. Luke, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're very kind. D- d- I uh, No, it's, it's it's not just kindness. I, I like to be as honest as possible, and um, not only uh, do you run a fine, fantastic comic book store, um, you also um, make some incredible drawings that you post online. Um, under, if you want to check them out, um, if you're watching a video version, which will be a unique thing, uh, it'll be on YouTube, um, but you can also find, uh, there'll be loads of drawings throughout, we'll talk about some, it'll, it'll be grand. And um, you can also find his work um, on Instagram, at yep. Ridgeware and where is so it's Ridge R I D G E and where W E A R absolutely and then at Luke Illustrate all caps on Twitter so check out his work on there uh, when you want to and and do it because he's fucking awesome so Luke um, yeah I wrote down a couple of things um, when you said you might want to be on the podcast mm-hmm. I mentioned comics of course that's a big one we'll get to collecting was something I think that we'll talk about as well absolutely Star Wars and and it says here again incredible illustrations um, so what you've written incredible illustrations it says it, says it. look at it <laughs> it does say that there Fair we go enough. Um, so what came because I, you know I've known you mainly for, well, first rather through Chaos City mm-hmm. and uh, you know giving comics to any and all who need them um, but what came first to you and tell me the story behind not only you being an artist yourself but loving comics and comic book art and stories I think the first, the one that came first was the art um, comics was I was quite late to comics to be honest um, the artwork came because my father is a quite well renowned um, science fiction artist from the 80s um, I think early 70s as well so he was part of an agency in London that had people like he was he was part of it and in that agency there was Jim Burns Chris Foss um, who else John Harris all people who had have who had produced concept art and creations for movies like Logan's Run Blade Runner Alien um, and while they had the people working on the movies my father was doing book covers and interior illustrations all done by hand so this is well before the day of computers or just when computers were starting to rise up but nothing was really they were still seen as novelties Um, and he was renowned for being one of the best at really precise minute details Um, so if you look at any of his painted work you can see the deepest of details from bulkheads to windows and things with these huge galactic starships so I grew up with a house full of creativity so I had spaceships on the walls, um, my father's um, RAF and aircraft artwork, animal artwork, um, my mother's own creativity in like arts and craft, and my little brother, who's a very, very good artist in his own right as well. So that fueled me. So I always, I was always drawing. I always, I, I can remember as a kid making up my own little sketchbooks of. Star Wars figures. I would, I'd buy the figures or get them with pocket money or have them for birthdays and then draw them with crayons and just whatever I had and then bind them together and make little books at home. Um, and that just rolled on to doing any time at school I got the opportunity to draw, I'd draw. Even when I was one, probably wasn't meant to be drawing, I was drawing. So my, my school books were always full of little doodles. I can remember maths books with lots of tiny little spaceships drawn in the bottoms of the pages, and it would go from page to page like a, like a follow the leader sort of run of little creatures. And, like and, a flip book almost. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. And so that, that, just went, that just went on and on, and I just, it was what I loved doing. It was, it was a safe place, but it was also 
I was never a very academic child, uh, you know, maths and English and stuff. I, I, they, they, my brain couldn't get round those, but give me patterns or drawing or architecture and stuff, and I was like, oh yeah, I can, I can see that. I can make that. I can make sense of that. The comic book side of it came into it when a school friend of mine showed me a Lara Croft Tomb Raider comic uh, from the late nineties, early two thousands. I was like, oh my god, what's this? What is this comic book thing? And I started picking them up at random like toy fairs and car boot sales, just random Tomb Raider comics. I don't know why I chose Tomb Raider. I think that was just because she was obsessed with them and I kind of latched onto that as the first point of reference for comic books. So it wasn't even you were into the games? No, no, no. Um, um, my first console was an N6, was a Nintendo 64. Ah. Uh, um, so no, 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 I had no background with the character I it was all be, it was because it was her first love and I was like oh, okay well that's that's where I'll start then so loads of people go oh it must have been Thanos or it must have been the Avengers it's like no it wasn't even close <laughs> I was I was I was on the other end of the spectrum when it came to comics I went in on random character being produced by Top Cow uh, which are uh, for image comics and yeah it started from there and I just, it, I kind of snowballed with that and just it built up and up from that. But yeah, the, the art came first and then the comics came quite a while afterwards. Well, in, in both cases, I imagine it's, it is that, and it, we see it all the time, you know, from the conversations you and I will have when mm. we're in Chaos City, the passion begets the passion, doesn't it? That, yeah. you know, someone will say, oh my God, have you seen this? And if you hear someone talking fervently enough about it, they enjoy it enough, mm. then you you are much more inclined than, especially if you've never heard of it or you've never seen it and it's something new, right? Yeah, yeah. To check absolutely. it out. So you you can't remember a time where you weren't drawing, right? No. Or, I, at no point have I ever stopped drawing. I, I And I say that in the sense of, okay, I might take a few days out or something, mm. but I will always, there's always a sketchbook. Like my studio has a shelf just full of sketchbooks that I've used, you know, just doodled in. I have, I always have a sketchbook near me um, because if I have an idea, I'll, I want to put it down on paper, even if it's a tiny little doodle, so I'll, I can then flesh it out when I have time. Um, yeah, I can't. But I think that's, I think that goes without saying. If you have, if you grow up in a house full of musicians or a house full of artists or, I don't know, gardeners or fashion designers, you're always going to have that around you so yeah it's uh it's all it's all part of the the, the upbringing i think mm. and and also i don't even think you mentioned your dad's name if anyone wants oh, to check out his um, art jeffrey ridge um yes he is on instagram um i will find that while we talk because <laughs> terribly I can't that's that's fine it's, it's exact but, uh, but based on it maybe he's got a super cool 80s handle relating to the science fiction you know he's uh Asimov, eighty-two. <laughs> I don't think. Uh, no, oh, I, no. Maybe not. Nice and. I think it's just his name. Um, I tell you what. I. I if yeah, you, you if send you, it to me. Send if it you to me. search, if you find me on Instagram. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. You can find my um, my father's comments on my work, and then you can go straight from there. But it's all his old work he did from his advertising days and his days and his sci-fi greatness of the 80s through to paintings he's doing now he's retired and he's found that he's got his own digital tablet and stuff so mm -hmm. yeah but it's all it's all his his greatness and his stuff yeah but here's the thing you have that greatness it's clearly been passed down i do my best with what <laughs> with the skills i have produced i i think i've learned this years ago that trying to emulate another artist is a flawed way of going about it you cannot like I can look at some of my favorite artists like my father like like Adi Granov, uh, Esad Rivik um, oh, let's um, probably yeah people like that and I go man I wish I could render like that or draw faces like that or um, or put like construct scenes like they do and you'll try it and you'll just be like no that's not even close. Why can't I do that? And then it, you, all you'll get is that I'm unhappy with it. 
the best thing to do I think is just just take inspiration so if you see something you like go hey I like the way that's been done and then you try it you try it you know do it in that do, do it in that way so so yeah I uh, I do my best that's what I uh, that is what I always say I'm uh, I do my best hey that is the way to do it though and I think what what maybe I should have worded it as was to say that it is evident to me that some of that talent has been passed down and that even though yeah it's not necessarily through emulation or imitation mm. but um you know as you say growing up in a household of artists it's like you are pun <laughs> pun mm. puns aside drawn to draw you mm. you know you were it was something that you grew up around and um you know you you, you that that's what happens when you grow up you either almost rebel against things or you go go with that flow absolutely es- especially if it's um something which you, you also mentioned earlier that you felt it was a sort of a safe space for you oh absolutely my art is um my art is where i go to sort of let out my quirky and and overactive imagination so i i can i can remember many times i've been walking down the street or walking through london or at work and i've seen something or or whether it's a street lamp or a or something a car that's driven past or the way the light has hit a building and gone hey i like that shape i like those colors i like that looks cool i can remember once walking in london and seeing uh, these ashtrays that were bolted to the buildings all around the financial district of london going hey look they look like they look like classic like doctor who robots and I was like, oh, I could use that. I can take inspiration from that and be like, okay, we'll we'll work that into something. Um, but yeah, drawing has always been my place to sort of dive in and be creative. And it is a it is a skill and a and a ability that I can that I like to think I'm pretty good at, and I can continue to build upon. You know, it is my thing. Everyone has their thing. Drawing is my thing. Yeah. No. I. I can definitely agree with that and so you mentioned then that obviously the comics came later mm. but now you alongside doing your illustration whenever you can you know and having it you know be something that you still are so passionate about you manage chaos city comics in saint albans mm-hmm. and can you tell so can you tell me how that came about for you a very yes um I had been working for Boots for so the the chemist for God six years maybe um, I think it was six years and the then owner Derek came uh, messaged me one day and said I might have a job for you I thought he meant freelance work so I said yeah sure we can sit down we can we can discuss whatever you want to do like what you're thinking and he goes no no a job like I want to have you on the team I go okay. So I went and had a meeting with him and he gave, he showed me what he wanted to contract and the money went through it over it and I'd already known Derek as a friend for a couple of years before this so it wasn't a, it wasn't completely blank um, like he just seen me and gone yeah you do this um, I went away and sat down with my family and couldn't see where I couldn't see how it was going to work for me financially at the time I didn't have any massive like outgoing like the, a mortgage or anything like that so I said no I went to Derek and said no thank you very much but no then about god it must have been two two three days later all my closest friends turned up at my front door and said hey we're going to go do some photography do you want to come with now, for for my group, my close group of friends, that's not as some people might think that's odd. That's not odd for us. We're all we 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 all come from such creative backgrounds. We're like, yeah, okay, we'll go do photography. That that works. It wasn't photography. They staged an intervention, <laughs> and they turned to me and said, "You are taking this job because you're miserable in your job." I was, and you know it will be the right thing to do. The one thing, the the main thing that was stopping me was the financial aspect of will I be able to pay my bills. So after this intervention, um, I sat down again and looked over things and realised that I could, I could make it work. So I went back and said, "All right, yeah, let's do it. Let's give this a go." 
And I have the picture that Derek took of me on my first day, which was June 16th, 2011, of a lesser bearded man <laughs> with a ridiculous hat on and um, standing, in, standing in front of a wall of comics and, and you say like, hey look, hey guys, this is Luke, he's gonna start working for us. And at the time I was just assistant. I remember my first job was hoovering the, hoovering the stairs and painting walls. And I spent a long time painting the, so the basement level was my first job. I spent six months cataloging that, all those comics, about 30,000 comic books and painting the walls and getting that room ready to be a second part of the shop. Wow. So, so yeah, I owe a lot to my close group, my friends group who came to my front door. I don't know if they ever even remember it, but I do. Um, and said, you, must take this job um yeah and thank god i did because god knows what i'd be where what i'd be like if i was still working for uh, that major company um <laughs> but I, that but so yeah and in those words it'll be eight years next month no where are we eight years and a month and a bit that kind of scares me actually eight years i, I will be perfectly honest i was never meant to stay at chaos city this long yeah it was always a job to sort of yeah i'll do that for a few years and go somewhere bigger or do something different but the the job and the love of it and certain circumstances meant that it kept me there and i've built and then from there i've been able to rise up to manager and build uh, my own system within the sh shop that seems to be working so yeah. I, I think it's working working out really well. I think it's I think it's great. And with that then will have come obviously you're almost I'm sure you would knowing Derek, you will have known Derek who was the founder of Chaos mm. City and manager at the time that you started, um through presumably going to the shop and buying comics and being having an interest there. Yeah, yeah. Um I was I first um, the store was originally put together by a gentleman called Richard who now has his own store in Stevenage and then Derek came along shortly after oh after yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, I got um, that. yeah and I remember going to there and buying Pokemon cards as a 5, 6, 7 year old and then when I got to like 10, 11 just starting senior school I started going in there with some buddies and buying comics mm -hmm. and then getting to know him as a person to the point where I could walk in and Derek would go, hey, look, man, read this. You've got to try this, man. You'll like this. Uh, or check these statues out or, or, you know. And that's how we built the, we built up our friendship. So I would walk in on a Thursday on my lunchtime and be like, okay, Derek, what, what should I read? What, what's good? <laughs> Terribly of me, I wasn't reading many of them at this point. Because <laughs> between the Tomb Raider section part of my comic book world and becoming friends with Derek, I hadn't read comics. I'd stopped for a large, quite a significant few years. Um, I'd actually gone through a bit of a manga phase, so reading um, Akira and Gantz and what else was I reading? Um, my shelf is a blur. Um, well, that fits in though, almost, and, yeah. because that illustration style is, at least from what you're telling me about what your dad drew, mm. manga is so much more dense yeah, especially something like Akira. Oh yes, I've... the artwork is you know packed with that intricate kind of detail, yes, right? Absolutely, Akira is one of those movies that was a groundbreaking piece of animation for anyone in the world of art or or animation. It, it without it, uh, like I was saying to you about how Enter the Spider Verse recently is one of those groundbreaking moments for animation and art. It, it's one of those things that without these films what we see as animation and, and artwork would not be like this. But you go every, you know, the world of all massive pop, pop culture areas have those milestone moments. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the manga was a, and Akira and Ghost in the Shell were two massive parts of it, were definitely massive bits for me. Um, but yeah, I was, he was introducing these comics and I was buying them, but mostly just because for the artwork, I'm definitely driven at the time, I was driven 100% by, hey, that looks cool. I want to read that. Or, I, well, I want to look at that. I want to draw stuff from it. 
um, because you were filling sketchbooks alongside yeah, it yeah, as yeah. you were going, yeah. right? I had massive A3 sketchbooks that I'd get from the little art shop from at my school, and I'd fill them with like re- reproductions of pages or my own versions of something, and they'd have no rendering, they'd have no depth, they were just line art. I can remember pencil piece, pencil art that I was doing, they were just lines. I would draw them with a 4H pen- pencil, which is like drawing with a piece of granite. It had almost no impact on the piece of paper, but it, but that's for some reason that's what I drew with. And my dad would continually say to me, why don't you render these? You know, render one, you know, shade it in, shade it like that. And I was scared. I was terrified at rendering it and going, well, I've ruined that. And it's, you know, it has a, like a eight, nine, 10, 11 year old guy. That's even more terrifying than doing it now as an almost 30 year old, because as a kid, you're even more susceptible to the idea of you've done it wrong. And you've made that mistake. Um, and when it's your thing, when it's your safe place or your thing that you love, it's even worse. It's like, you know, play, I suppose, loving football and then trying to score the ultimate free kick or the ultimate penalty and then always hitting the crossbar or always shooting it off into the car park behind the goal or something. No, I know I know that feeling when, when, you, when you're creating anything mm. and it is the, you find out that somewhere along the way you made a mistake that you didn't realise yes. and it's affected the rest of it or that you reach that point where you do dive in to try and do do something new that you don't you're not quite sure about because you don't have confidence in your abilities and it is you, you're bricking it you're mm. absolutely scared to because you love it so much and you don't want to ruin something that is a piece of solace for you yes absolutely mm-hmm I um, as the years have gone on, I've learned that some of it only recently. Like you, the best thing to do is to when you're producing a piece of work is to finish it. Just finish it. There is always this hump that you have to go through in the pro- production of something where you're like, I've, I'm sick of looking at this. I don't want to redraw this anymore. But once you get past that little hump, you start rolling into, oh, there it is. That's what I want. That's what I was looking for, and it's. Yeah, it's gone from drawing line art to actually rendering things really heavily to discovering my own way of rendering things that has created a more... Um, I had someone pr- liking my work to Bernie Wrightson a couple of years ago, which for me is a huge accolade because he is one of the all-time greats from comic book work and stuff. Uh, and yeah, so it's a... Continu- but as people say with anything like this, you don't stop learning. There's always something to do or something to get better at. I, I, th- I think it is a continual process and one thing I'll say for knowing your work at least over these past few years mm. y- if, you, if you told me as you just have that you used to be scared of rendering and shading uh, I, I got be, I'd say come on don't, 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 don't <laughs> shit me like, yeah. that is, because your work has a depth to it and I'm almost certainly going to lack the art- the art- verbal articulation to describe it accurately but the levels because you do so much of your work um in black and white mm. um you know monochrome style that you use shadow and there is that you know depth and levels of a gradient of darkness you know and as you say bringing out your quirkier weirder side mm. uh uh, oh god what was it the spider mandibles one <laughs> your version oh, your spider the spider the spider more the, the one spider I drew. Yeah, yeah that was so great i loved that yeah he came from uh, most people who know my work know i love drawing monsters now if you met me as a eight nine year old kid i drew nothing but spaceships i loved spaceships I still do but i felt because again my house was full of aircraft and spacecraft that my father was designing and drawing so i was always surrounded by that but for some reason my my artistic sort of hand drifted towards creatures and monsters and from there I've just always drawn them every now and then I'll throw the odd like Inktober last year just gone I did a series of tiny little spacecraft Mm -hmm. um, because I felt I should probably change things and switch it up a little bit but with the monsters I love everyone has something that freaks them out or scares them or you know everyone has what they perceive to be a monster whether it's a political figure or a 
even a, I don't know, a member of family or something or a situation that's happened in their life that mm-hmm. be like that's monstrous that's horrible and i always found that the best way to sort of cathartically get past these things is to give it a physical form so i've drawn like um mental health issues like i've depicted depression and anxiety in the form of a physical being but with the spider-man stuff well no with anything actually i always go down a dark route because it's that it's that age-old thing of the bad guys always seem to look better or things like that like they're more the the, the, the villains are the more compelling yes. characters so much especially in stuff like comics right yes you it, as as great and as cool as batman is it's the joker oh yeah absolutely uh, you know it's green goblin it's dr octopus mm-hmm. uh, these the, the 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 complex the tragedy of these figures consumed by their own hubris yes. or mental health issues ego um uh yeah a psychological breakdown of some kind because of uh, uh you know the lizard he he turns himself into a monster because he wants to heal himself. Mm-hmm. He he he, fe- he and it and it all goes horribly wrong as it, as it funnily enough seems to quite often for these characters. Um, yeah. But I I find that obviously you know growing growing up in you know the the sort of the environment of spaceships and space travel and that being in its own way and I, if I could just be like you know grasping at straws and pulling too much out of this but that's a very escapist kind oh, yeah, of you know the, good, yeah. the, the idea of going going to the stars star wars um uh, you know which we we can definitely we could do a whole other podcast on I'm sure um we will that sure. yeah that yeah. is that is something which you know it is that you know that is safe space almost and then but it coming back always to you for artistic manifestation of these monsters as you say of mental health issues Mm. and it's has it been a a, you say a cathartic way uh, for you to deal with these things and and help 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 you cope right yeah absolutely um um yeah i mean it's no it's of no it's no secret to my friends and family that i've dealt with um, depression, anxiety, like severe stress problems, and social social anxiety as well. Um, all my life, uh, I can remember back in like when I was eight, nine, ten years old, being like, "They don't like you," you know. You 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 you're part of that group. They don't like you. You're the you're the weird one that sort of sticks around with them. You know, they keep you for sort of comedic value. There is there was nothing anywhere to to solidify what that those thoughts but my head was going yeah no nah, you know to hell with that you don't want to be part of them because they don't like you you should you know go dwell in that corner over there um and then there was i can remember there was a uh, my anxiety got hit a peak during my mock gcse's where i made myself very ill where i could i couldn't I wasn't eating, I wasn't drinking, I couldn't literally go in to do my exams to the point where I had to have them all, re- I had to do all my exams in closed conditions. The idea of sitting in a hall with 50 other kids was, I tried it. I remember walking around, I'll do this, I'll try it. And as soon as, my, as soon as my bum hit the chair, I went, I faint headed and I, I just stood up and walked out. And all the teachers were looking at me, it's like, what's he doing? Like you know, like you're not conforming to everything. Where's he going? So I just looked at the team and went, "Yeah, I'm not doing that again." Like I was pale, and I was, "No, I can't do that." Um, and it destroyed my um, my self confidence, which has never been great anyway. But what kind of confidence I had dis- dis- disappeared, um, and I wore, I went into a sort of downward spiral of not being able to get to a sort of academic level that the rest of my friends and school like peers I suppose is the word Mm -hmm. were were at but the art was always a place I could sort of disappear into whether it um, even with more of my hobbies like photography and stuff it was always something I could dive into and disappear into and feel a bit safer but yeah the the depression side of things has got it those panic attacks or that that sort of poor point during my GCSEs took me about two years to get back over Um, and I only maybe only in the last 
couple of months. I was actually thinking today, actually knowing that we were doing this podcast, thinking how am I feeling in myself, and only and probably in the last last couple of weeks is the best I've felt in myself for a long, long time. Now I can remember terrible points, and of course, you as a friend, Joe, and knowing the store, and a lot of friends and family know of what the store went through when we lost Eric, and you know, and to us he was all a friend, and he was, mm-hmm. you know, a great friend, and obviously, some I lost a mentor and a friend, Marina lost a a husband and that took us Marina and I that took us two and a half years to get everything in every facet of his death sorted out you know and at that point dealing with that I mean I'm not complaining this is just the facts of what we were going through we were work I was working six day weeks you know I was running I was keeping everything running while Derek was doing what he could from his bed you know and obviously Marina was dealing with everything all of Derek and everything else but from the outside Mm -hmm. Um, and I was woefully thin I was woefully underweight and um, I've always been a slim guy but I was woefully underweight Um, and all these things have built up and it was always that sort of thing of I sort of hit this horrible low point kind of built myself back up and then I'd hit and then I'd fall off and hit another low point like dealing with the death of Derek and having to sort of understand that all the things we had planned were now gone and I had to sort of step up and become the face of the, of the business overnight and Marina had to become the, the the owner overnight and we had to then inform people who had who we had been telling white lies to for 10 months that he was gone we were telling everyone it's like, where's Derek it's like, oh, he's working from home you know you know he's he's um he's giving me more free reign so he's working from home and you know you know you just keep missing him you know that sucks doesn't it you just keep walking in when he's mm-hmm. not here but we for for his own peace of mind we weren't he he didn't want anyone to treat him differently but at the same time we didn't want anyone jumping on him every time he saw him going hey how you doing how you feeling you feeling all right he just wanted things to go on as normal mm-hmm. and then we had to turn and go no he's gone you know mm-hmm. you know he that's it you um and that's heartbreaking, especially when you've got to tell people who have known him longer than you have, or tell kids who have grown up with him, like, yeah, Derek's not here anymore, you know. I remember yeah. having to separate, like, can I speak with you, not your kids, for five minutes, because it's going to really upset them, but mm-hmm. I know you can take it better. So, yeah, all those things pile, have piled up over the years and I've dealt with them in my own ways and I can rem- you know I can remember the worst part points and uh, and uh, I've uh, bombarded lots of friends with my uh, hor- my low point ramblings from the depths of my own head you know and they've been all very exceedingly uh, open and uh, have put up with a lot of me just being at my absolute low points while I've dealt with these things or dealt with my own neuroses and the things that go on in my head um, but I have used them as best I can as a fuel to fuel my artwork in a good way and also looking at them as things of like yeah you you dealt with that as dark as it was or as horrible as it was that you got past that and you can go on yeah. you can make it and it's it, there's I've, I've watched a great video recently about um it was the Vlog Brothers, Jonathan Green, who mm. I'm, I'm a huge fan of, and everyone hears me go on about them too much. Um, mm. But the, but the the types of fuel that we burn, mm. the positive and the negative fuels that we burn, you can you you can run for a good long time, you know, on that sort of bad fuel, but actually, you you that that you get the best, and you are able to recoup the most out of you know sort of get being. As you say, seeing your way through it and realizing what you have done, mm. and the fact, acknowledging that actually, it was you know yeah it was personally hard for me, but it was always going to be hard for anyone who would have been in that position. Absolutely, and um, friends, uh, not not suffering in silence ever, because you know you can't you know you have to let it out somehow mm. and it is the more that you retain it and internalize any and all of those feelings and those 
pressures coming from different parts of your life, it will come out in a bad way yeah. more often than not, which you don't want to do because then it is going to not only negatively affect you personally, but also the people who you care about. Absolutely. And um, I, I think that what you, uh, you know, it is, it's great to hear that you are now you feel like and obviously it's taken all that you know two and a half years is a long time and it especially feels longer when you're sort of stuck in it i'm sure yeah. but that you know you're now get and i and i think we we had this conversation maybe with, with some point within the past few months where it was just sort of like actually things at the store and and personally are they are feeling more at that even keel level yes. that we're not snowed under we're not you know and I, and i'm and i'm feeling you know better than i have in a while and that's 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 fantastic yeah uh, we the store the store has never been at a point where we were truly scared or worried but it was hard it was very hard um there were points where Marina and I were at each other's throats. And it's not, um, you know, and that's because we were both coming into a situation that we were not prepped for, that we both had to deal with in our own ways. And it took, that took years for us, literal years for us to actually get to a point where, oh, okay. And it, lit and it, it took one sort of conversation where we suddenly went, oh, okay then. And then from there on, it's fine, we can just, you know, now we, we go and look at a house on fire. But it's not, that's not a bad thing that we went through that because if we had kept up, we if we'd kept those emotions of what we felt from those different points of view of that situation, it would have been catastrophic. Um, and I'm sure I've pushed some friendships to their limits with how bad my depression and anxiety has been. And it's never been something, it was never something I meant to do. I've never gone out to push anyone too far or use my own mental health as a battering ram against someone else. It's just, there are sometimes you feel, I think everyone goes through this if you have mental health problems. You feel helpless at points and you're like, they don't want to be part with me. They don't want to talk to me. They, I can't talk to them because they, they're fed up of listening. Um, and you're like, uh, all right you know so you you have to, sometimes it just all sort of flows it just well, like vomit it just sort of all comes out at someone you you sort of speak at someone and I'm blessed with a incredible mind-blowingly good group of friends and family who are open-minded and understanding and I love them all to bits even if there are day there are times when they don't see me for six weeks because I've retracted back into my own mm -hmm. shell and I'm doing my thing it's not because I don't want to see them it's just it's just how my head works you know there are day times where you know I just want to do things on my own or I, I just can't bring myself to the I can't bring myself to the idea of going to that bar or 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 um, you know walk, going to that event in London or something mm -hmm. like that it, it's nothing personal it's nothing horrible it's just it's just how my brain works and I say that I feel good at the moment. I do. I, this mm -hmm. is the best I've felt in ages. But I know from the from how things work that it could be a week or a month or a year, and my brain could completely flip and I could fall down that rabbit hole again. Mm -hmm. But it's it's that constant battle of making sure that does not happen by keeping yourself busy. Or um, well, you know. and yeah, through some of it ends up being distraction but also as you said talking about um you know how you knew you were going to do this today um it's saying to yourself oh you know do actually because we i think don't often don't take that time to do that mental check-in with ourselves mm -hmm. um and that is something because we end up getting either so caught up in a moment of um high tension or emotion that takes hold and is difficult to find your way out of you can't see you know as you said it's a rabbit hole or you can't find the wood for the trees mm. you know that kind of thing um or you and i, I can completely and this will 
still I'm sure surprise some people who don't know it about me um there have been points where I've been at my lowest mm. and I I may have said to friends well I, I I there was one super low point where it's just you know coming on three four years ago now I think where I could not go out to meet friends yes yeah. I could barely and only just meet them on a one-to-one basis mm. and struggled even then to be the, you know, overzealous, uh, extroverted, talkative, you know, can't shut up, God, he's loud guy mm. that most people would say they know me as. And I was a shell of my former self. Yeah. And it was... It, it, and 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 then at that point because I'd never saw myself being there the confidence was gone like you talked about earlier you know you you even even though you know that you there have been plenty of times where you have you felt the complete opposite and you've not felt that way you really do it is a struggle yeah to see a point where you will be even okay again let alone happy let alone joyous or excited or you know overjoyed yeah, you, yeah. you you really it, but but that's the most important thing as you said that you can get through it and you have to give yourself and allow yourself to take that time hmm. in order to do it and to you know in a in a kind of roundabout way exercise those demons draw those monsters put them in the book <laughs> yeah i mean that, that's what a lot of my I, i've had people message me on my artwork and say why can't you draw nice things why can't you draw pretty things and i don't take that as someone like kicking me in the balls and be like i, I take that as a like thanks very much you know um, <laughs> And <laughs> this is horrifying. Yeah, and oh, like, yeah, that's the and point. <laughs> I don't go out to. I'm not going to draw like horribly grotesque and like things that you. I'm not going to draw things that are going to make you go. That's revolting. I don't want to draw. Yeah, see that. yeah. I would never say yeah. that. You, you, it, I've never looked at any of your work and thought that like, that's repulsive. No. It doesn't. It, it doesn't make you want to look away. No. Right. I my art has always. I've always said this that I like to do art that makes people obviously look at it that goes without saying um but like kind of look at it and go ah oh, that shape's nice or that rendering's cool or why is does he why is he wearing that or you know ask questions like create questions as you look at it but yeah i've had people say why don't you draw nice things and someone in my situation could turn to that person and go blah 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 this that the other how dare you don't ask silly questions you know but i don't see it as a silly question it's just you know that's a fair point i don't draw nice cuddly things there are plenty of people out there who do you know and, it, and but I like drawing I like drawing the monsters because and the creatures and the aliens because it is a not only is it cathartic for, for th- bad situations that you've been through but it's also a un, it's a limitless world that you can mess with because we've never met extraterrestrials or we have never seen if there is life out there which I wholeheartedly believe there is but we haven't met it there's nothing aliens can look like whatever you want them to look like you know Uh, and monsters can look like whatever you want them to look like or they can be manifested from whatever you've seen or heard or dealt with in your life and that's great because it lets your imagination out so it's like a nice double ended for like a t- double header, you can cathartically get these demons out of you and, and make them physical on this piece of paper, but also you can let your imagination go nuts at the same time and kind of give them 15 arms and 12 eyes or make them all gooey and, and you know, uh, just you can ex- horrific. You, you know? can express something and explore something yes. at the same time, right? Yeah, that's, that, that is a good way of, of looking at it, yeah. And I, I know there are loads of people who look at my work and go, why? You know, uh, that's, it's not, my art is not something that you stick on in a frame in your hallway. Um, I know it's not that sort of artwork. It's not, but that's all right. Because I'm, I know that there are people who have, who have purchased my work or, or I've produced work for who have, 
got my work and have displayed it somewhere, you know, but in their own studios or in their own like like safe places and stuff like that. Um, it go I, it goes in Tim Burton's hallway. Yeah, yeah, I suppose, yeah, or Guillermo del Toro's. Section, Actually, yeah. that's the better, yeah. Or, and I can't not mention this because it, it popped into my head earlier when you were talking about, you know, sort of monsters and, you know, the things you draw. Or Hideo Kojima's hallway mm. because you got a mat like so for those who don't know Hideo Kojima is the creator of Metal Gear Solid which is an immense game and series and character in Solid Snake um he's one of the most prolific game developers um and you know absolute masterminds in the gaming industry um and Luke uh recently drew a character from his forthcoming game mm-hmm. Death Stranding um and he um he picked it up and retweeted it to you know I'm sure his like million followers or however many he's got and uh, you know that uh, how was that for you? I produced that piece of work because I loved the character as soon as I saw the man in the golden mask I saw him appear I was like I love this mix of technology and the sort of Victorian macabre I like I love this and to this point whether you're listening to this podcast as soon as it comes out or in (laughs) at this very point we have no I'd still have no idea what the game's going to be mm-hmm. about everyone it's all theory um, but I had to draw him I loved it the look so yeah I drew it I drew him in black and white and then I did a colour version with some gold ink as well um, I don't use colour very much so the colour one I was happy with but I was, wasn't overly happy but the black and white one I was really happy with how it came out yeah and I and I sent it to him like all fans do I tweeted him and said yeah. hey you know I love what you're doing This here it is I can't remember exactly what I wrote and um, he retweeted it and I pulled like for me it's a lot I pulled like almost a thousand like people like retweeting it and yeah. everyone was so very lovely about it and yeah he he, I think it was Kojima himself retweeted it and I was um, absolutely blown away because I um, normally I post something and then leave it alone and then I come back to it the next day but I kept, but my phone just wouldn't stop moving across the table, <laughs> which is which is very old for my phone. Um, so I just picked it up and I went, "What's going on?" My Twitter just kept going nuts, and then I just kept looking. It's like, "Hey, dude, this is amazing. This is great. Thanks, you know." Um, yeah. So I was that that monster. I really that creature or that guy. I really enjoy drawing. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why I love like another one is um, uh, Studio Ghibli and um, Miyazaki is that most of his movies have got some physical monster in it that creates that is connected to something like uh, Princess Mononoke is a great one um, like that sort of, those sort of worms that darkness that moves across mm, the land and the yeah. idea of man destroying life uh, and then but life is pre- pre- like life is depicted by that huge For, the, the, the forest, the forest spirit walker That's yeah um, and Kawanashi no face in Spirit of the Way he's a He's a spirit that's got that can only, uh, as far as I got this correct, he can only be invited into a home. He can only walk into a house if he's invited. He has no personality. He cannot talk unless he in, he he eats he, someone. He, and, and and his and his entire thing is consumption. Yes, it is all consumption. Once you extend that invitation, mm. he devours as much as he can be given and. You see all the all the, the 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 humans and the frog people like running to get dishes for him. Yeah. Because, you know because he's because then also doesn't he? If I remember correctly, doesn't he then turn the food? He he, he effectively excretes it or regurgitates it as gold. The gold he, he gives gold to them. He has gold to give. I he, can't yeah. The I the I I'm still not. I'm sure there's people listening to this going, "How could you not see this?" Um, the gold side of things he seems to latch on to people and the gold is like a, an, in, an incentive mm-hmm. so he has an insatiable bottomless appetite for everything so he gives you gold and in turn you bring him the food and he eats it and whatever and it just keeps him running yeah. but he can only but hence why he takes on the form of the frog when he eats the frog oh that's um, what, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I always saw him as a great metaphor for mental illness because the idea that he is a creature, a darkness that consumes everything, and that is what, in you know, my head, is what depression is. If you have it, it when you're at your low point, it consumes everything. Mm-hmm. Your everything you like, everything you enjoy, um, 
you can't watch sport you can't listen to your favorite music you can't play a video game you know um luckily it never consumed my love for drawing but that's what it is and i think that's why i sort of latched onto him also the fact that i adore the, f the fact that miyazaki can create the simplest ideas of this black cloaked creature with a mask a very simple mask and it be such a uh vibrant character mm -hmm. um I think that's why I latched onto him, and I've drawn him in my own ways multiple times. I think I try. I say to myself, I try and draw Karen Ashi once a year in some sort of different form because he's fun and he's good. He's good exercise. He's good like artistic exercise to keep you know to try different rendering styles and try mm -hmm. something new. Especially since he is that he's got that almost that ethereal mm. kind of darkness to him, that depth, and he has his you know it all as you say it comes out in many forms, and I think that that is so the spot on the way you describe it that yeah depression does consume everything and also takes on these different forms for different people because oh, yeah. you know it's. <laughs> As people, I've heard people joke about before. It's it, depression isn't the uh, you know the, that late night advert you see where it's you know the slightly middle aged woman and she is just like, are you feeling depressed? And she's like sad on the side of her bed and you take the pill or whatever. It's like it, that's not it. It is. It can be that. Yes, it can. But, uh, and 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 that's not to decry anyone who feels like that mm. sitting on the edge of your bed, middle aged woman, who I'm sure is the primo audience for this podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it, it, and and I think one of the things that we we've touched on, and I I will want to continue to touch on, is the fact that it 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 it's a it, it is a beast that takes many forms, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I um I have done that thing. I have woken up and sat on my side of my bed and looked down my garden and sat there for twenty minutes. And I'm not staring at anything. I'm just staring through. Mm. And, I, and then I suddenly my brain clicks back and I go, the "Hell, am I? What was I doing?" Um, I can remember a really low point last year where um, I physically couldn't. Um, I would. I was sitting here on this sofa with my head in my hands because I just couldn't. I felt so ill. Not that I was gonna like throw up or. I just felt ill, mm. like just out of all energy and just disgusting. Um, and I just sort of like, bring deep breath, pick yourself up, get your ass, go to work. Because work was the thing that kept me running. It was just something that kept me ticking over. I could focus on paperwork or admin or mm. or writing press releases and you know stuff like that. Um, and just um, just it just kept me rolling. But yeah, it, it, it does. I um, it always it, it makes my blood boil whenever I hear someone still say to this day. Um, oh, you'll be fine. Get over it. Mm. Or or you'll be um, you know you're not. You're not, you know, you can't, you can't be that down about it. It's like, don't ever, ever try and understand or judge someone who's been through a mental illness before, because it may hit you. You know, it may not be depression. It might be suddenly social anxiety or, um, or, um, or just heavy amounts of stress at work and stuff. And you just won't be able to, you know, you'll then know how bad it is. Um, yeah, it, it it may not affect everyone but no. it can and i hope it, but yeah. and i know yeah, yeah yeah as you say yeah hope hopeful that it doesn't but mm. it can yeah it can for for a myriad myriad of reasons yeah 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 it's uh it's well because i was saying it's horrible and i've um my head has luckily never reached the point of suicidal thoughts but i know of a lot of people and i've known people who mm. have gone that far and and luckily, you know, and I've luckily not taken themselves over the edge, but have always have got yeah. to that point of feeling truly at despair. I've come close, but I've never mm. got to that point. Um, but that's where you have to surround yourself with good people and lovely friends and, and, and good family and stuff. And if you don't have one, then go to the other. If you're struggling with a friendship group at the moment, then go to your family. And if you're struggling with your family, then talk to your friends. Yeah, and, 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 and not only that, do... Um, I don't know if it's something you've ever done, but do talk to a professional as well, yeah. a counsellor, um, 
local counselling services um, if you can find them um, some of them are free like we've got you know for young people in Solomon's there's Youth Talk which is a great one um, I would say and then you know and do talk to your doctor and um, if they because I think at least that I've I've sensed there's sometimes a thing where um, at least in like a GP for instance yes. because they're not um, trained to necessarily identify those things do be as honest as you can be about how you're feeling to yes. them um, because a lot of the time unless you're feeling suicidal they that it's not something they're going to take you know they're like okay well you know maybe you know just try and get eat, eat, obviously you know these are important things as well you know eat well and you know try and get some rest and sleep well and see how you feel mm -hmm. but you know do hammer home that if you are actually feeling consistently low and down and in in a darkness of some kind do talk to them because then they can hopefully set you up with someone who, who you can see on a professional basis because it's yes. it's it's you know and, it, and it's not going to work for everyone you know and medication doesn't work for everyone but um it, it is it's well well worth seeking out even if you have tried before and not necessarily been successful yeah uh, as you said and i agree the key point is honesty be mm -hmm. honest because doctors aren't there to laugh or poke fun or snigger or scoff at what you say. They're there to help you. Yeah. The, 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 the honesty bit is absolutely paramount. And I've been, you know, you, well, you just have to be open with them. Yeah, and I've, I've done the medication thing and I I've, um, I've, haven't done any sort of like cognitive stuff or any like counselling. Um, just speaking to my GP has been enough. But, and then I've done the beta blockers thing and, you know, and some antidepressants and things. Um, and I find that every couple of years I have to go take, put myself back on them because it does help keep us even keel. Yeah. I'm not on them at the moment, which feels nice. Although the uh, your uh, my brain doesn't function very well. There's a sort of um, a, a sort of cold turkey period where my brain keeps keeps kind of shouting at me, going, "Where have they gone? Why aren't they here? <laughs> uh, bring them back!" Yeah, then, yeah. The chemical imbalance is here. It, it is, we need yeah. to write it. Yeah. But it's really bad. And then after about after about three months, it, it relates to a level, and then I'm all right again. But yes, honesty, is, I agree, is, um, is is absolutely paramount. It has to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think with that, I want to say thank you because you've been so honest and open with, with me here. And it has been fantastic to not only hear about, you know, the lowest points, but also, you know, the highs and talk about those with you. And brilliant uh, if you told me before I forgot about it but knowing and hearing the story about your you know the fact that you grew up in a house full of illustration and it's 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 I, I hope that anyone listening has enjoyed it as much as I have um, because it's been brilliant thank you so much no worries dude pleasure as before as I mentioned go look at Luke's art it's fucking brilliant <laughs> Um, at Luke Illustrate on Twitter, at Ridgeware, W-E-A-R-R-I-D-G-E, -E, mm -hmm, yep. <laughs> uh, but the other way around, on uh, Instagram. And um, also, if you are just listening to this, but you want to um, see some of the art um, without having to go to either of those places, if you go to, if you search Madness of Two on YouTube, maybe it'll come up in a search, we'll find out. But just go to Joe Medforth, my YouTube channel. I'm going to put up a video form of this, um, which is going to have Luke's art throughout. You'll see the metal, uh, not metal, Gear solid, the, the Death Stranding um, image alongside many others. And um, also, as always, the music that you heard at the beginning and end of this show is Highlight by Messenger Down, my friend Garrett Foster. Go check his stuff out. It's awesome. It's on Spotify. I'm pleased that the podcast now exists on Spotify without that being like copyright striked or whatever. I guess Spotify is a little more freeform than YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. That's enough of my rambling. Um, thank you so much for listening. Luke, thanks again. Pleasure. Is there anything else you want to say before you go? Um, I don't know, man. We could uh, we could go for <laughs> ages, couldn't we? We, um, could, we, could, we could. We won't this I time. Just, I would say, um, one thing I would say actually is um, the way I, the way that I run um, myself at the store is that it's always a place, um, the comic store is, comic stores are a place for people who feel out of place to come and feel part of something and I have made it part of what I do to always be able to talk to anyone about anything, you know, so uh, if you, you know, that's, it, I'll always, I'm always there if someone wants to talk, 
always, you know, and I will always do my best to, uh, you know, unless you catch me in the busiest day of the week or if I'm truly snowed under by work, I'll always, uh, people can always come and just chat with me. Uh, um, I'll talk about anything, really. That's the other thing. Go to Chaos City Comics in St. Albans. Um, it's in Heritage Close, isn't it? It is. Exactly. And uh, so it's just by the clock tower. Uh, you, you know, turn, turn left off the clock tower. You can't miss it. And uh, also visit Empire Records, the sister's store. Um, maybe I'll talk to Dave or uh, Eddie. Oh, and certainly Marina, maybe, on a future show. Thanks for listening. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.